Episode 19 of the Wild Fed Podcast, A River of Grass, Alligators in the Everglades with Dr. Laura Brandt is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Now's the time to fortify your immune system with scientifically validated nutrients, functional foods, and herbal medicines that give you confidence and peace of mind. Consider Colostrum, one of the flagship products at Sir Thrival, and a functional food I use daily in my morning blended drinks. There's a study hosted on PubMed called Prevention of Influenza Episodes with Colostrum Compared with Vaccination in Healthy and High-Risk Cardiovascular Subjects. The following is from the abstract. Quote, The efficacy of a two-month treatment with oral colostrum in the prevention of flu episodes compared with anti-influenza vaccination was evaluated. Groups including healthy subjects without prophylaxis and those receiving both vaccination and colostrum. After three months of follow-up, the number of days with flu was three times higher in the non-colostrum subjects. Colostrum, both in healthy subjects and high-risk cardiovascular patients, is at least three times more effective than vaccination to prevent flu and is very cost-effective. Close quote. Additionally, check out Sir Thrival's other immune-building formulas like their D3K2. That's vitamin D3 sourced from lanolin and vitamin K2 from Japanese natto. And also have a look at their reishi and chaga dual-extracted medicinal mushroom formulas. Both of these mushrooms have demonstrated antiviral activity. Remember, a strong immune system is always your best defense. Check out the lineup at surthrival.com. You've been listening to the Wild Fed podcast, but have you seen the TV show? Season one of the Wild Fed TV show is eight 30 minute episodes, each of which features hunting, fishing, and foraging for wild foods, meals prepared by chefs and home cooks, and shared with the friends and family we hunt and gather with. If you love outdoor, adventure, or food TV, you've got to check out Wild Fed. Go to wild-fed.com to see the season and episode trailers. All eight episodes are available to watch right now. This podcast was conceived as an adjunct to the TV show, so if you haven't watched the show, you're really missing out. Again, go over to wild-fed.com to see the season one trailer and individual trailers for all eight episodes. I suspect people will be spending a bit more time indoors over the coming weeks, so now's a great time to purchase your subscription. That's wild-fed.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Today's interview is with Dr. Laura Brandt, regional scientist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service based in South Florida and lead wildlife biologist at the Arthur R. Marshall Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. We recorded this interview shortly after my first alligator hunt, which was the feature of episode two of the Wild Fed TV show. Before that hunt, I did some research on North American crocodilians, and that kept leading me back to the Everglades. So I was really excited to sit down with Laura and learn not just about her work with American alligators and crocodiles, but also about their habitat and the restoration of that habitat, the river of grass we call the Everglades. This interview is exciting to me for several reasons. Many of us have visited or even regularly visit Florida, but are unaware of the anthropogenic degradation of the Everglades and the bipartisan restoration efforts that have been underway there since the 1970s. It's considered the most expensive and comprehensive environmental repair attempt in history. Also, the American alligator is an Endangered Species Act recovery story, which is something we can all feel really good about. And lastly, the alligators themselves are incredibly fascinating animals, defying many of the ideas we generally have about reptiles, especially when it comes to their courtship, mating, and the way they rear their young. Now next week, in anticipation of the fast-approaching spring turkey hunt, we'll be sitting down with Carter Heath, the regional director for the New England branch of the National Wild Turkey Federation. The man is passionate about turkeys, and if you're a turkey hunter or interested in becoming one, you've got a great podcast to look forward to. But today, let's take a deep dive into Florida's shallow waters with Dr. Laura Brandt. Get ready to learn about the state's invasive reptile problems, the surprisingly gentle mothering of alligators, and why you probably shouldn't walk your dog by the water's edge. Thanks so much for tuning in, and until next week, I'll see you later, alligator. I'm uh, here in Davie, Florida, just north of Miami, 
with Dr. Laura Brandt. Laura, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Uh, really nice to meet you and uh, fun doing a little pre-show chat with you. So I'm going to make you go through some of the stuff we talked about again, if you don't mind. But if you could tell us a little bit about uh, your background and the work you've done. And if you don't mind, I'll jump in from time to time and just kind of drill down a little bit on what you're talking about. But tell us how you end up here in this office, where we are and sort of what your work's about. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll give you the short version. Okay. Um, I'm in a uh, University of Florida office right now, but I actually work for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. That's federal. And it's a federal, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a kind of a unique relationship that we have a partnership here with the University of Florida and USGS and Fish and Wildlife Service, and we all kind of work together to help look at Everglades restoration and um, whether or not we're doing the things we need to do to protect okay. the environment. And one of the things that I work on is the American alligator and the American crocodile. And so we use those as ecological indicators to help oh, us understand okay. if all the money we're sending to the Everglades is doing what we want mm -hmm. to do ecologically. Let's zoom out for a second. And if you could tell us a little bit about, I guess about Florida in general and in particular about the Everglades, because the Everglades is, as I understand it, a pretty unique um, habitat and geological feature, right? Um, and Again, as I understand it, as a layperson, we've done a lot over the past century or centuries to drain it, to change it, to alter it. And maybe the average person does not really have insight or understand. And, and if you were to drive through it, not knowing as maybe an ecologist or didn't have the eyes of a, of a trained scientist, it looks like a giant swamp. So you might not know the um, amount of impact that's happened. So why is there Everglades restoration and what's been going on with that? And, and what is that? What is unique about Ever the Everglades? Right. So so uh, the Everglades is, is pretty much from um, the Kissimmee River, which is north of Lake Okeechobee. So if you looked at a map of Florida, you see a big lake there. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like that people call it the, the heart heart yeah. of beat of the of the Everglades. So the water flows south out into the southern part of the peninsula of Florida into Florida Bay. Okay. And historically the Everglades used to be a lot larger than it is now. If you look again at an aerial photo, you can see that on both the east coast and the west coast, instead of natural habitats, there's now a lot of people. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, of buildings and, and housing developments, but there's also a lot of agri agriculture. And so that's one of the primary things that we've done to the Everglades is that we've drained it mm -hmm. and we've built up around it um, and we've changed how the water moves from pretty much north to south. Okay, we've changed it in what way? So the water was flowing north to south. So it was flowing north to south without any barriers. Okay. And so now if you if you drive uh, from the east coast to the west coast of Florida, you drive across long ri roads that if you look on either side, you'll see that there's marsh on both the north and the south. Okay. And so essentially what we've done is we've put dams across. Uh, in a, the form of roads. In the form of roads across what was called the, the river of grass. Uh, okay. Now, the the gradation there is um, very subtle, correct? Yes. Yes. And so it allowed, as I understand, the diversion of water in, in many directions, which wouldn't be possible in a lot of landscapes because of elevation changes, right? But the elevation change is very, very shallow there? It, it's a very shallow elevation change. And, okay. and I grew up in Pennsylvania, so I, I you know, right. know about you mountains, yeah. mountains and things like Hill that. And, but, but I've been down here a long time, and yeah. so I tend to forget when we're talking about high elevation areas in the Everglades, we're talking about three feet. Oh, no kidding. And, and a lot of people don't understand that, but it is very subtle differences right. in the topography that create some of the uniqueness of the Everglades and how it functions. And there was a lot of political rhetoric early on about, it was sort of like that manifest destiny attitude, right? About like draining the Everglades and creating agriculture and creating space for people was seen as sort of, I guess, our, our natural role in the ecosystem, right? And that's changed. So how have attitudes changed about it? And, and what is the restoration effort? When did that start? And Right. So there, there, there's actually been a number of different what they call the errors of Everglades restoration. Okay. And so the first was the drain the swamp mentality, like you were saying. And so it was to come in and put canals in to move the water off the land so that people could live there. Then there were a series of hurricanes and that caused great devastation and people died. And, and so then it was, well, we got to do something about flood protection because we have to protect these people that we've put in this wet wetland area. 
So that was the second era. Then it was, uh-oh, if we're putting all the water, if we're moving all the water off the land, then there's no water during the dry season for people to uh-huh. drink. Right. And so it became then a, a, an era of water supply. And then we all realized that, well, we need to work in harmony with the environment. We right. can't start moving water off and then trying to get it back. That maybe if there's ways that we can figure out how to keep it on the landscape and make that good for both the environment, but also for people, because people rely on the water. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't understand that basically your water is coming from the Everglades um, because that's where the water collects. If you're seep- in Florida, you're if you're in Florida, southern Florida, yeah. If you're in southern Florida, because the water seeps into the into the ground, and then we pull it back out again. Okay. And so your your Everglades is actually your your collector okay. of that water. It helps to keep the saltwater intrusion from coming in. Um, as um, as we pull more water out of the well fields, the water, the salt water from the shore can move Infiltrates. into you have open aquifers here no? yeah I mean, unlike where i'm where i live up in maine these aquifers are open to the surface in some areas in some areas most of our drinking water comes from a little bit lower than that but okay. but but yes for example if you if you um put water on the surface here it will soak down into um the layer below it is it a lot of limestone like There's we were just in the, the keys which is all yep. coral k right so that's all that porous limestone so it's similar up here yeah did the did the glades extend over to where miami is now yes so yes. miami was part so was a miami swamp. miami parts of miami so it wow. was very really interesting so if you look at miami and if you again if you looked at old photos of it you'll see that there's there's wetland areas that come out and then there's what call are called little finger glades so little areas of wet that go out to the coast in in those areas where miami is there's also some more high ground mm-hmm. around Miami, <laughs> the, the Pine Rocklands, right. and that's a, that's a system that is often adjacent to the Everglades. It's a slightly higher elevation and allows pine trees and things like that okay. to grow on it. Okay. Um, and then you get a little bit for, further north where we are here in Broward County, and you get slightly different types of habitats. Mm-hmm. And so you get some of the oak hammocks. Yep. And you get um, extended... Oh, so you'll have oaks uh, here. Are yeah. They, are, like, are they um, tall oaks or are they shrubby? Yeah, there's tall oaks. Yeah, there's okay. live oaks here. And, and so you'll get these pockets of much higher mm-hmm. ground, <laughs> you know, maybe Meaning. six, seven feet, you know. So, <laughs> um, and uh, you'll, get, you'll get oaks and other, other species that are okay with living in the dry, okay. dry areas. Something that stands out to me, I had read, um, I've got a real interest in anthropology and and how people i guess the ethnobotany and the the hunting and gathering of native peoples and how they fed themselves and almost always you you're reading about people who are somewhat semi-nomadic and that they would follow food seasonally on some kind of rotation but there's a few places in the world where you read that there's so much food abundance that the people could be somewhat sedentary and i read that about southern florida that the there was so much food here like how have we changed the the distribution of species, how have we changed it by draining and cha- well, altering the habitat of the Everglades? Because it was an incredibly rich area, yeah, right? Yeah, so we've, we've done a number of things that have changed the way um, both species and people mm-hmm. uh, can move across the landscape and live in the landscape. And if we just go think about all the way in the south part of, of the Everglades, and there's an area called Cape Sable. And Cape Sable used to actually be fresh all the way up to to the to pretty much to the shoreline because there was enough fresh uh-huh. water coming down in there so that wall of that, fresh that water. wall of fresh water could help keep the salt water out and that was a very very productive area there used to be otters down there you oh, read yeah. some of the old books and they talk about how how lush and how productive it was right. um, they would go in there and they would fish and they would oh, hunt the shellfish and they beds would, were incredible uh, shellfish beds they would hunt alligators they would hunt um, otters uh, and and set up communities in mm-hmm. that whole coastal area. Well, now that area is not so much fresh. Mm-hmm. It's more salt water. It's converted the habitats to to a more brackish water system, and it's just changed the dynamics mm-hmm. of what's going on. That's one of the things that we're trying to fix with Everglades restoration. Okay. Is we're trying to get more fresh water to those estuaries, those those areas between the fresh and salt water that tend to be worldwide very mm-hmm. productive. But if you starve them from from fresh water, 
then be, they become yeah. less less productive. What you called it before a river a river of river grass. River of grass. Yes. What is the headwater of that? Like where does this water we're talking about where would it come from? Does it come from? It's just being diverted. So it's still coming down but it's getting moved out to sea in different areas. Yeah, so so it starts the river of grass really starts up in the Kissimmee River okay. plains mm-hmm. area. And if you look again, if you look at a map, you can see how we've encroached in on the development up there. Okay. Goes into Lake Okeechobee. And then historically, there was no dike around Lake Okeechobee before we, we put right. that there. And so that was a very shallow, large lake. And when it would rain, it would fill up. But yeah, then it's it would, a massive lake, but, but we're talking what kind of depths? Um, I'm, I'm not sure how deep it is at but the not middle deep. point. But not, not shallow a, body. Yes, right? again, relatively Relative, speaking. Yeah, yeah so, mm-hmm. so, you know... Um, it not not like the, some of the lakes that you get that are you know hundred feet deep right, or something right. like that. No, no, it's very very shallow shallow lake, and so the water would flow. It would it would overfill the banks and flow south and then to the east and the west, flowing through the the there, there was a pond apple um, forest right below the edge of the lake. What was it? Pond apple. Pond apple. Now, pond apples are really interesting because they're actually edible. Oh, and so tell me they're, more. It's a, it's a <laughs> <laughs> so it's another one of those natural, you know, okay. fruits that. Yeah. What kind of plant is it? It's it's um, a known a nona. I have to look up the. Okay. It's a but, but it's, it's a, a tree. It's, an it's a tree. tree. Okay, it's a yep. tree. Um, and so there was a pond apple forest at the edge of the lake, and then it would flow into and become more marshy. It would be the sawgrass. Okay. And so you get the sawgrass plains, and that's where the river of grass came from, uh-huh. from the sawgrass. Which and the so, early explorers complained. I oh, mean, I've, I've been reading it. accounts yeah. of what it would do yeah. to their bodies over time, especially if they spent months in there, how yeah. ripped up they'd be. So, so have you experienced sawgrass? No, no. <laughs> okay. So You so, have, evidently. <laughs> well, so one of the things we do when we take people out and we teach them about the Everglades is we give them a blade of sawgrass just, just yeah. to show. And, and one of the things is you, you don't want to go up on the blade because it's got like it a will, serrate it, leaf margin. A, it, it, will cut, it will cut you. It's, yeah. it's called oh, sawgrass for a reason. It will actually cut you. Yes. Yeah. It's not just yes. a little scratch or abrasion it'll, and, cut, it'll and cut into you no it, it can get wow. it can bri- and so yes imagine tromping through there right. it would be quite uh oh. can be quite uncomfortable oh i bet the everglades um, can be real uncomfortable uh yeah and that and the mosquitoes are yeah. Really hard, yeah between that well uh, i want to anchor then in what we've been talking about because we're gonna we'll circle back to it but how did you get an interest in the everglades and in crocodilians also i'm curious where that emerged what what made you uh, a person from Pennsylvania, you said? Yes. Decide, yes. like, I want to spend time in, in the Everglades with, with crocodilians. Well, so um, so I've always been interested in animals and being outside and, from and when all you were of young. that from when I was young. And mm-hmm. so when I, I, I did my bachelor's at Penn State, and um, I was in biology as, as my major, and I was fortunate enough to do a field-based program where we looked at the ecology of the Barrier Islands in Virginia. And it was awesome, and I would, you know, strongly encourage people to do internships and do field-based yeah. programs because it really opened my eyes to what was out there in terms of a, an ecological um, focus, and the, that that there was something out there called research that I H- could had do. you yet had? Um, did you grow up with any like exposure to the outdoors in that yes. kind of way? Yeah, yeah. So what when was your when I was that? growing up, um, we would go camping a lot, you know, over the summer. Mm-hmm. Um, my parents sailed. I learned how to sail, oh, okay. so we were at you know Moraine State Park and Lake Glitzen yeah. and and all that. And one of the things that they would always do is try to take time um, when we would go on the, these weekend trips to take us to the state park so that we could walk around and, yeah. and look at things. And so yeah, so that I'm yeah. fortunate that you were I had drawn some, to that already. And then we had a vacant lot. And we had the woods, in quotes, yeah. in our backyard, which at the time, you know, when you're little, it, yeah. it seems like, but Vast. it really turned out it was just a, a vacant lot right. where the stream was the runoff from the uh, <laughs> neighbors. But, but it still had salamanders in yeah. it. It still had frogs. We yeah. would find turtles mm-hmm. and we'd go make little forts back there. So, yeah, yeah. so I was fortunate that I had some outdoor experience um, there. And then in my sophomore year, or my junior year at Penn State was the first time I had the opportunity to come down to Florida in January. Mm. 
And um, <laughs> after that, You're I like, realized, whoa, wait a second. You don't have to be cold in the yeah. wintertime. <laughs> and I came down, so I was working in a lab, and I was working on cleaning cages for alligators and crocodiles. Oh, okay. And so the, the field work for the crocodiles was down here, and so that was my first time to come down to the Everglades, um, go out in Florida Bay and wade up the creeks and look at nest sites and wow. things like that. Were you and scared so, at all at first? Um, no, no. Um, it just because I, I felt comfortable in the outdoors, and yeah. so it, it really it just yeah. seemed like an adventure. Oh, that's cool. Um, when you're when you're driving from Miami to the Keys, and there's that whole stretch where it's fenced on either side. Yes. I'm just curious about that because I'm wondering if that has anything to do with crocodilians. Yes, it does. That would make their it, way out. It, so there is um, Crocodile Lake National Wildlife Refuge mm-hmm. that that is set up down there. Um, one of the things, so that's part of that's part of the area where the American crocodile occurs. So a oh, lot of people, it does. a lot of people don't realize that that in Florida. We have two native species of crocodilians. One's the American alligator, and that's what everybody is most familiar mm-hmm. with. The other is the American crocodile, and there are a lot fewer of them. And they are um, fewer of them here fewer because them their here. range extends south, correct? Yeah, they're so not, they, they're not in, um, in any kind of peril, but it's just that the well, they actually are listed as threatened. Oh, they are. Okay. Yeah, and and in most of the world, they're listed as endangered. In Florida, they're listed as threatened. Oh, okay. Um, That's a political reason for that? Or? They, um, their populations really decimated in uh, the, before the 50s. So people came down and, you know, once, once people started to colonize um, Florida, they realized that there were things that they could take advantage of here, both to eat but also to use for, for, for hides. Yep, for the and, market. And so there were, there were a lot of people that were hunting both alligators and crocodiles, and it, it, it basically it got out of control. This was, do you, this was subsistence or this was probably market hunting? Market hunting, mm-hmm. market hunting. I mean, some people were doing it for subsistence, but that wasn't what pushed it over the edge. It was the push for getting hides to, right. to make a living off okay. of it. And so there, um, the number, the, so crocodiles only occur in the coastal areas in Florida and, and they require they, salt water to some They degree? don't require salt water. They can, they can live in salt water, oh, okay. but they, um, they actually prefer fresh water. Oh, okay. But there are, are, they're at their northern part of their range here. And part of that is because they're not very tolerant to cold temperatures. Oh, okay. And so most of their distribution worldwide is in more tropical areas, mm-hmm. areas that say stay warmer than we have okay. here. Okay, as opposed to the American alligator, which has some some resistance to cold that surprised me. Yeah, so so the American alligator occurs all the way up into South Carolina, North Carolina, and even used to have populations in the Great Dismal Swamp. And wow. they're, mo- they're much more tolerant to cold temperatures, and in fact... When I uh, was working in South Carolina, I actually worked on a study looking at alligators and caimans. Caimans are a um, cousin to the alligator. They live in Central and South America and are not as tolerant to cold temperature mm-hmm. either. And it turns out that crocodilians are really fascinating because they have physiological and behavioral things that allow them to survive in different environments. And one of the behavioral things is that alligators know when to bask when it gets too cold or when it when they won't know when not to bask when it gets too cold okay but caimans and crocodiles don't oh okay so it gets to be about 50 degrees and the alligator somehow understands that if it gets out to bask it's not going to be able to raise its body temperature it'll lose temperature it'll lose to the temperature. ambient air temp so it stays in the bo- in the water right and it will sink Where, down to the, the water, bottom when the water temperature is warmer than the air temperature right Okay. Well, not and and even 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 well, we'll get to that in a minute. But so so, but the but the caimans and the and the crocodiles, what they do if it's sunny and it's still cold, they'll come out and they'll try to bask. Hmm. Okay. And so what they do is they just expose themselves to more cold temperature, and then they mm-hmm. get sick and die. Wow. All right. And and in fact, some of the guys that at at the um, alligator farms, you know, before there was like major heating systems and things like that, you, they used to have to go chase their crocodiles back into the water during the really yeah. cold winter months. No kidding. Um, and then in 2010, when we had the, the hard freeze down here, there were over 150 alli- uh, crocodiles that were killed from that freeze. No kidding. But the alligators so, were okay. But the alligators were fine. Right. That's fascinating. And and I want to touch on this issue with the caiman real quickly, but actually look at it a little bit bigger picture. 
one of the things that stands out about Florida is how significant the issue with invasive reptiles is here. So can you give us a little bit of the landscape of that issue and this and the scope of it? Yeah, so so we have more um, invasive um, reptiles and amphibians than we do native reptiles and amphibians down here in South Florida. Unbelievable to hear that. Unbelievable. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is um, the environment down here is very um, hospitable mm-hmm. for things. I right. mean, think about all the people that have moved down here. Yeah. I mean, why do you move down here? Because yeah. it's nice and warm and you don't have to, to worry about the cold. And Well, there's a lot of species that mm-hmm. can, can thrive down here. Um, the other thing is that there are several major ports of entry. You know, they, Miami is a major port, right. and things escape. Yep. And um, so, yeah, it just makes for a a good place to be an exotic animal. If right. You're, you know, if you escape off of a out of a, a shipment or something, your chances so you got of got shipments surviving. coming in. Do you have the issue of yep. ballast being dumped and things like that? Like we have that in the north, where ships will will empty their ballast, and you'll get. I don't know if that's an issue here. So yeah, you, not. I don't think so okay, much. So you're getting more a, ship, but we're getting it's it's more it's more people bringing them in things escaping and then and then the pet trade trade. and 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 that's you know that's one of the things where people can be more responsible with with their pets Mm -hmm. um it's i know some people think that oh there's a nice natural area there i don't want this pet anymore so Mm -hmm. let me go let it free be free Mm -hmm. that's that's not a good thing to do who stands out to you as as um species that um have got into the environment that way. I had initially heard iguanas, but then I heard no, probably more like they came in ship I- shipments. Um, but I'm curious what, what you yeah, think. Yeah, so, so we have um, the introduced species of crocodilian down here, the spectacled caiman. Okay, he came from and, the pet trade. And that yeah. came, probably came from the pet trade yeah. because, because uh, caimans are cute when they're little, yeah. but they're, they don't make very good pets because they're fairly aggressive. And yeah. once they get to be big enough to really hurt you when they bite you, it's kind of gets annoying and, and if somebody grew, grew them out or let them grow out to full size they would get to be about about seven or eight feet and, and, do people, and so, <laughs> it's just i just can't picture that it's very short-term thinking you know right, when you exactly you know do you exactly need to do that? exactly okay so you've got oh. the caiman in the environment here right and just real quick like uh, who oh, actually i'll let you finish the thought about other other species that are from the pet trade that, that are escaped I, I imagine the um the pythons as well yeah um yeah, those are those are you know introduced from the from the pet trade in some manner or another. Whether people let them go because they couldn't handle them anymore, or they escaped. Yeah, sometimes the hurricanes um, themselves will will be the, the and cause of the escape, right? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes yeah. that can happen. Though though the state of Florida has done a really good job now of trying to make sure that that folks have um, the appropriate housing. If they're dealing with okay. exotic with regulation species, yeah, um, and plus people don't want to lose their their critters. Right, I mean, if right. they're if, they're, if yeah. you're trying to, to sell them, there it's expensive and valuable. But it, yeah. but it does happen. I mean, sometimes yeah. you can't just just deal with it. Yeah. So we have um, there's a there's a not a lot of there's tegus, oh, black okay. and white Argentine tegus. Yeah, this is a lizard. Um, it's a lizard. Yeah. yeah. In fact, we have one out front. Oh, and no he, I don't know if he'll be buried in, under the ground, but he might be in the tank out okay. front. That we can we can take a look at it. Um, Nile monitors. Really? Yep. That's a large lizard. That's a large it? lizard and they're not yeah. We're, Where we're, are they? They are they're they're in a couple of places. Um they're in not too far from here. There have been some in Southwest Ranches, which is to the west of here, over mm-hmm. towards Everglades Holiday Park. Um there's a population up in the C fifty one canal, which is uh, just north of the Arthur R. Marshall Loxatchee National Wildlife Refuge. In okay. fact, we're we're working on a project now to try to see if we can eradicate them there. Oh, full eradication. Um, it's yeah, possible well, there. Well that's that's what we're evaluating is oh, okay. is is it okay. is it can we can we just contain them or is it okay. possible for us to eradicate them? We might That's be, so interesting to we me. We might be able to like, eradicate like them. Like I said, we were just in, in the Keys hunting iguanas and you just get right. the sense and that that is a not a possible, well, eradication is probably not, not something uh, that's going to happen right. in our and, lifetime. Anyway. And there's a lot of work being done on trying to get uh, iguanas out of different areas because yeah. they do cause a lot of damage to vegetation and, yeah. and things like that. So Chameleons, I've just been hearing and chameleons, about. Chameleons, yep. And, and so chameleons are ones that it's really interesting because um, some of those populations are self-seeded by people who want to grow them. Yeah. And so they put them out there 
so they okay. can go and re-harvest catch more them. and reharvest them. Because they can't import them, Because right? they can't import them. Okay, so this is a loophole so, so, that they're using in order so, to be able to trade in them. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so there's wow. some issues oh, like that. It's frustrating but, to, you know, I mean, I, I understand that most people are probably not really aware or even connected enough to the ecosystem to understand the impact that they could be right. having. But it's frustrating to, you know, when you read about what a place was like. And then to see sort of the impacts of it. I think the lionfish issue is another good yep. example of this yep. here, too. So, yeah, Florida's just been the receptacle hey, for oh, so yeah, many. Oh, yeah, and then there's all kinds of aquatic species yeah. that, are, that have been introduced, you know, the, the introduced fish yeah. and things like that. So. so so back to the caimans. Are they are, uh, exotic, but are they invasive or, or are they not really create? Are they creating any issues with habitat or other wildlife? Um, so they they can create issues and and actually when when we first um when we first started noticing where they were and and one of the places where there's a population is the homestead air force base which is very close to the florida power and light turkey point power plant which is where there have been a lot of crocodile nests Mm -hmm. and so we were concerned that if caimans moved into that area that they because they tend to be more aggressive is it warm water there because of the plant or something, or does it just happen that that's um, where they are? The the crocodiles are actually what what we think cued them into that area is the high ground for nesting. Okay. And yes, there is warmer water there, but it's kind of a, a secondary benefit mm-hmm. or or not, depending on how warm it is. Um, so yeah, so we were concerned that that the caimans would move into that area and displace the crocodiles, and but but they haven't done that, but they have. Um, they do establish populations in areas and cause problems. Okay. Um, like I said, they're a little bit more aggressive than right, alligators. Right. Uh, at the Homestead Air Force Base, they had problems with them getting on the runways. Oh, no kidding. And, and Coming so out to bask that, on the runway? It, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's not very good if a plane's trying to right. land or take off. So, <laughs> so, um, so oh. yeah, they they fortunately have not spread as much as, right. as, you, as you initially yeah. – Potentially how tolerant are these three species of crocodilians to one another? Um, and how much overlap do they have? Hey, we'll get right back to the interview in a moment. But first, domesticated, civilized living restricts the natural movement of your human body, forcing you daily into chairs, cars, and rigidly defined pathways. But when we head out onto wild landscapes, we carry these dysfunctional, domesticated movement patterns with us. MoveNat is a natural movement system that trains you and your body to move like a human animal again. Are you interested in building natural movement skills that'll improve your physical capability in the field and in everyday life? MoveNat's new Level 1 Fundamentals e-course is structured to help you re-educate your body using practical, natural movements that enhance fitness, function, and physical capabilities, all from the convenience of your home. Learn to move the way nature intended. I attended MoveNat's Level 1 and 2 trainer certification courses a few years back and came away with practical knowledge and skills that I use every day and that have changed the way I train and move across the landscape, vastly improving my overall mobility, coordination, and fitness. This new e-course is movement-rich with clear instruction. Its progression-focused methodology takes you from restorative mobility exercises to challenging movements. All ability levels are welcomed and accounted for. Enroll now at wild-fed.com forward slash movenat for instant access to the full e-course. Again, that's wild-fed.com forward slash movenat, M-O-V-N-A-T. Again, wild-fed.com forward slash movenat for instant access to the full e-course containing 16 classes designed to be followed over four weeks with specific and measurable movement goals for each week. The course is self-paced and you receive lifetime access. MoveNat. I can personally recommend it. It's a fitness and movement system that's designed for the wild. Now, back to the show. So alligators and crocodiles overlap in a few places. In Everglades National Park, there's places where you can see them both together. And um, they're they're fairly tolerant mm-hmm. of each other. It's more, uh, like I said, the caimans are a little bit more aggressive, and so probably not as likely to see them hanging out and basking together. Yeah. Like we've seen alligators and crocodiles basking oh, on top of neat. each other. Really? In, oh, that's in some neat. of the places. Oh, I'd like to see that. Um, 
you know, in breeding season, then dynamics change a little bit more so because the males are defending their territory mm-hmm. against whoever happens to yeah, be there. Yeah, that's and, not, that, and so, yeah, it's not a species, but, thing. but it's, it's not just, like, right. It's not like they right. routinely, like, like alligators and crocodiles don't routinely run each other off okay. just, just because. And, and we were talking before about, uh, you were saying about the uh, market hunting and the, the trade in pelts and the impact. I also, from what I understand, the, the, Alligator, American Alligator was on the ESA or, or yes. whatever existed before the ESA. Were they on the ESA as yeah. well? Or, yes. Or, okay. Yeah. yeah. And then they've been considered a recovery. Correct. Can I'd be curious how you feel about that personally and, and you know, outside of the politics of it. Do, do you consider it a recovery personally and then um, and a success? And then also just sort of what, ha, what how serious did it get and where is it at now? Yeah. So, no, I, th- I, I think it's a great example of how the Endangered Species Act can work. Mm-hmm. And so the fact that both it was listed and now it's been delisted is really the whole purpose of the act yeah. is to help to 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 save things and make them so that we can then and now we have sustainable alligator harvests. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's it's a big success. So it goes back to what I was talking about before with back in the 30s, 40s and 50s, when people moved in, started being able to get into Florida and they started harvesting alligators and crocodiles for meat and hides, and it got out of control. And so they reduced they d- reduced the populations to levels that were of serious concern for people. And so by by putting the alligators on the on the endangered species list and actually protecting them before that, then it allowed the populations to recover, mm-hmm. and then it allowed the um, the state to come up with a way to manage them sustainably so that you can both protect them and protect the habitats that they're on, but also use them as a resource. How do you feel about the hunt? As so that today? I think I think hunting is, is a great mm-hmm. thing for people to be able to do as long as you're doing it responsibly and and um, you know, making use of, of right, what right. you're what yeah. you're hunting. I mean I think it's one of the things that we can use to help connect people with their environment. Right. Um, and to understand the the how things fit together, and the way it's managed now, it's a lottery based. Yeah. Um, so so permit? the state of Florida manages the har- the alligator harvest, and there's certain places where where you can hunt. And what you can do is you can sign up online, and then um, they pick the people for each area based yep. on on the lottery. Yeah. Okay, and the hunt itself is, um, it's day or night. Yes. And it's, I've seen a couple methods. From what I can tell, it's, you need to secure the alligator first. Is that yes. how it's done here? Yep. So yes. they'll use, I assume, what, a bow or they'd use a treble hook or something like that. Right, and or a, a noose. bang stick or something like that yeah. at the boat. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you're not allowed to shoot alligators here right, in Florida. Right, right, with a rifle. Uh, right, 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 right. You have to have it. Right. Um, is, um... They're a wanton waste law. Do you have to, how does that work as far as the meat? Do, are you required? Can can people come in and hunt it just for a trophy or are they required to to make use of that meat? Um, as far as I know, you're allowed to do whatever you want with the alligator mm-hmm. once, once you get it. The exception is that in some areas there are some warnings for like mercury and things yeah, like that. I would imagine and PCBs so they, must be an issue too. They suggest don't. strongly <laughs> that you don't eat it and you're not allowed to sell it oh yeah yeah so yeah, yeah but the hide you can do, do whatever what with will. and so yes you could just hunt it as a as a trophy animal and and not make use of right. the of the meat do you ever eat alligator yeah. yourself yeah, yeah i it's like a, alligator I, I like it too it's a really incredible meat um we hunted one that was a bit bigger than i would want to hunt for food but like i said it was i was telling you before it was a nuisance tag right. for a wetland and um and they have a lot of folks recreating there and so the real big ones they want to take off so uh, we're we're chewing our way through that alligator <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i would have liked one about half the size for food but this is the one they really wanted to take but um so circling back i, I after hunting that alligator i got very interested in learning more about them and and understanding the species and there are just some fascinating things about their natural history and I was wondering if you could take us through some of those unique 
characteristics, maybe starting with um, some of uh, the the parenting that they do, because I think that's really unique. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the really cool things about alligators is their parental care, because um, you know most people think about reptiles and they don't think them as being very maternal Just or icy or things cold like that. is what it's I would a, imagine. Yeah. So. So the first thing is the alligators, they'll build a nest. And so alligators will build a nest out of vegetation, and they can either do it on a, a tree island, a slightly elevated area in the marsh, or they can they can build it basically right in the marsh, and they pile up the vegetation to create the, the, high, the quote, high ground that they need to deposit deposit their eggs they do that with i mean their and hands are, they, are, are look strangely humanoid in the shapes of them are they functional to, they, to use like that? um some they it, they've got claws and so they scrape up the vegetation yeah. with both their front and their back legs yeah. and they use their tail and they use their mouth okay. and they pull up the full vegetation and yeah. yeah so it's a yeah it's a full bar, full body workout yeah <laughs> um, and in fact if you look at if you see an alligator nest in the marsh you'll see a big ring around the the nest that's all clear of vegetation because they've just just kind of scooped everything around yeah. and piled it up and and then they'll put their eggs in in the nest um and then the mama alligator will will attend the nest and she'll she'll do she'll have varying levels of nest attendance not all alligators do the same thing some of them just kind of visit it periodically um some of them will bring water and drop it on top of them some people say that they you know they urinate on them to help change the 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 moisture in the nest um, and some alligators will defend their nests vigorously, yeah. and so from from all kinds of things like people or raccoons or, or say or predation on or, those eggs would be yes. would be so yeah. raccoons. Who else? Yeah, um, raccoons, otters. Um, when when the babies are getting ready to hatch, actually, wading birds will also okay, as, so the, as the as the too. mama mm-hmm. the mama is is coming through there. Um, one of the other things about alligator nests, too, is that they create high ground in the marsh, so other reptiles take advantage of their nests, too. Okay. And you'll find turtle eggs in them. You'll find snake eggs in them. You'll find lizard eggs in, in them. Stashed in so with her in clutch? With, or? In, with, in the nest somewhere. Not really? necessarily in the same spot <laughs> as her eggs, but, yeah, but yeah so, so she's creating an environment for other things. Right. She'll get then, stowaways. Then when her nest is, has hatched, it still creates high ground, and then plants can grow on it. Okay, and so, so then it, becomes habitat it, it can for, become habitat yeah. for a lot of so so. How long from when she lays those eggs until they hatch? So it's about sixty three days. What's she doing incub- during that incubation. time? Is she still feeding, or she... she's she's hanging out around the nest, and you know if something's there to feed, she probably you know takes advantage of it, but um, she doesn't go very far. And again, uh, it's different for different alligators. I mean, that hmm. I've seen the whole range of of maternal behavior and and. Um, whether or not they'll defend their nest or, or or not, and so, but she'll she'll hang out there, and then when they the, when they're getting ready to hatch, she um, will go up to the nest, and and I think there's some probably some vibration that she senses, but they also make a little noise, <laughs> <laughs> and she will oh, she that. will hear that, yeah. and then she will open up the nest. And one of the really cool things about alligators is, you know, they eat everything that they can. So the bigger they are, the bigger the things that they eat. Okay. And one of the things that they'll do is they'll eat turtles. And so they have powerful enough jaws to crush the shell of a turtle. What kind of turtles are you talking about? Um, so like the Florida sliders, the hard shell mm-hmm. turtle. Well, they eat soft shell turtles. And so, so pretty much anything that they can get their teeth into. But the mama alligator, when she comes back to the nest and she hears the little babies and, and she'll open up the nest, and if there's, there's eggs that haven't hatched yet, she'll pick up the eggs in her mouth and she'll gently roll them around and crack them so that the using baby... Using her teeth? Using her, her, her teeth and her tongue and just the manipulating yeah. um, within her mouth and let the little baby out and carry it down to the water and let it go. That's and so amazing. here's this animal that can crush a turtle's shell... That can also be so gentle to help a baby alligator out of an egg. When you look at her mouth, it doesn't look like it would be capable of delicacy. Right. So that's a really interesting right. thing that she has that, uh, that kinesthetically that she can do that. Um, how? Uh, tell us about the mating as well. I'm, I, from, I guess from one book I read, I, I would like to, to find out if there's any truth to this. It was at least portrayed to me as being... Um, somewhat uh, gentle and even at times like um, 
quite warm. Well, yeah, so so this is another really interesting thing about crocodilians because they have this whole mating ritual that you wouldn't think where, you know, they'll swim around each other and they'll blow bubbles and the male will put his hand over her shoulder and and so <laughs> so yeah, I mean for Oh my for, goodness. For a big fierce critter, it yeah. does seem to be kind of Yeah. you know, very gentle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the infrasound uh, phenomenon is that well understood at this point, and 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 what is going on with that? Can you explain a little bit about what it is and what they're doing? So, so alligators, b- well, crocodiles too, but but they they make a range of of vocalizations, and one of the ones that alligators do is it's they they do the bellowing, which um, is a series of they you know by exhaling the air they can create these subsonic vibrations that actually make the water dance uh, on their right, right, on, above right, their backs, right over right. their backs i mean it looks yeah. like yeah it's like bubbling it's, up it's or, like or, or, bubbling up yeah it's, like you said dancing yeah and yeah. uh can you actually hear that audibly or is it all um subsonic there's 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 different parts of it okay. so i think there are two different ways of creating it and sometimes they happen together and yeah. some sometimes you can hear them bellowing okay what's um, the bellow like it, I, I can't imitate yeah, yeah, that yeah, one. Okay. I, can, I can do baby alligators, yeah, but not really well. it <laughs> But it's like a, people have characterized it as a roar. Okay, or yeah. A, yeah. Yeah, wow. Just a fascinating, fascinating animal. Um, okay, and then the, croc- the crocodile who's here sharing habitat, they have different times that they mate and lay eggs, so they're not overlapping those um, There's some overlap, but actually, uh, but crocodiles start their nesting sooner. So they'll start in March, whereas the alligators are, you know, more uh, May, and June, July, with most of the nests being laid at the, by the first week in July. Um, and then crocodiles have a longer incubation period, so theirs is about ninety days. Okay. And so, and they they will dig whole nests, or in Florida, they will sometimes make. Uh, soil mound nest, not vegetation. Yeah, okay. So they'll, they'll use soil, yeah. but not vegetation. Whereas the alligators okay. are pretty much That's vegetation. Neat. So it's it's yeah, it's a different kind of uh, of of way to build the nest. And and the crocodilians are also having some uh, important impacts on the ecosystem itself. Is that true? By by digging their wallows and things yeah. like that. Like how are they um, benefiting? The so ecosystem? so yeah. So alligators are are. are an excellent example of an ecosystem engineer and very important part of the... the oh, yeah, and as an the, engineer, the, yeah. Yeah, okay. the, the ecosystem. So I told you a little bit about how they make the, the high ground, which is the nests, and that creates habitat for things, other things to nest in and also for plants to grow on. But they also create the low ground or the holes in the system. And so what they'll do is when water, when the water dries out, which it does in the Everglades every year... Sometimes it dries out more than others. What time of year is it? And that's in the in the uh, springtime. So so um, April May is our driest okay. driest period. The alligators will um, dig out a hole that will um, be deeper than the surrounding marsh, and so it holds water, and so it becomes a refuge, okay. or as some of my fish friends say. A, a restaurant <laughs> um, for the fish and the other aquatic critters okay. that live there. And so they provide that source of water, and it also provides a lot of food for other things. So, okay. like wading birds use use them. Um, so you go from yeah. all of the wildlife is real diffuse throughout the Everglades, and then all of a sudden it starts concentrating in pockets. Correct. And at the bottom of that, you've got an alligator who's right. made that pocket. Right. Oh, that's right. clever. Yeah. And and that that whole dynamic of the wet and drying is one of the really important features of the Everglades. Mm-hmm. And so we can't, if it, it we don't want to, when we restore the Everglades, we're trying to get that balance of having it wet in the wet season and having it dry in the dry season because those those wets and dries is what drives the system. Mm-hmm. So when it's wet. Had it become homogenous? In some places it is. And okay. so one of the things we've done is we've put in a bunch of canals and, and levees around wetlands and, and not let the water fluctuate the way it, the way it did historically. And so when it gets... When it's wetter, the fish can can grow and and create large populations of them. But it's hard for things harder for things like alligators and wading birds to eat them, especially the wading birds that yeah, have yeah. have to have a certain depth of okay. water in order okay. to to feed. And so when the water dries down, it concentrates and makes the fish more available. Right. If it gets too dry, everything dies. Yeah. And so then it takes a 
takes time for the fish population to, to rebound. Recover, yeah. So you can't have it drying out completely every year, right. but you want to have it dry down some so that you can create that food source in right. the in the in the it's complicated right we have to try to manage it back to how it was naturally <laughs> managing itself right, right. Uh, correct how correct. where's the money coming from for this restoration effort so so the american people are paying for yeah. the everglades restoration and yeah. and so it's out of federal funding it's out of federal funding it's not like something that comes out of Pittman robinson or something like no, that it's it's no, money coming it's out federal, of some separate it's everglades restoration okay. funding yeah. for something called the comprehensive everglades restoration plan what are the um do we have like uh, timelines and, and goals that are that really stand out for like how how long term is this project or is it going to just be out into the foreseeable future? So so we're moving forward as 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 quickly as we can to try to restore the Everglades. There's um, there's been a recent project um, authorized called the Central Everglades Planning Process, which will help um, with the central part of restoring the Everglades. So central getting, geographical getting geographically central. So getting more water to Everglades National Park. Mm-hmm. Wow. And and the, and the areas within, if you look at, again, if you look at a map of the of the state and you see the big green areas in the middle mm-hmm. down here in South, in South Florida, that's what we're trying to, okay. to get the hydrology right on. And again, that helps everybody because the South Florida economy depends a lot on the Everglades. Yeah. And the Everglades isn't just that central part. It's also the Florida Bay and the coastal areas. And there's a huge fishing industry yeah. um, as well as the tourism there. So it's it's a real benefit to everybody to, to help move Everglades restoration forward. Do the, people, do the people realize that in those industries, do you feel like? is it, Or has there been any changing sentiment that you've seen over the course of your career as far as people kind of starting to understand how important that that is because it could seem really abstract to people I'm sure if they're they're not dialed into it yeah it I mean so so I think the people that live down here and make their living off of yeah uh, the reef or the you know the back country or the 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 environmental parts of the Everglades understand that the thing is in Florida we have a lot of people who come in here you know like I think it's a thousand new people every every year um, or every day to mm-hmm. moving to South to Florida, oh, and yeah. they don't under- a day. they don't understand the environment here because yeah. they're from somewhere else, right. and so it takes time. And so when you have a lot of those people here, it's very hard to keep the message mm-hmm. fresh in people's mind. And so yeah, we need everybody who who is a proponent of 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 the Everglades and understands the importance of it to be talking to your neighbors and, yeah. and sharing that message. Yeah. I can imagine people moving down here thinking of Florida as a giant beach. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or something like that, a giant resort. Um, this is a clunky gear shift. I want to add, this is a piece that I just have to ask because I've been wondering about with reptile physiology. Why is it that when a, with a mammal die, when a mammal dies, it, it dies usually fairly simply its nervous system seems to shut down is what I'm saying with a reptile. It's as if it is still animated long after you have taken steps to ensure that you have shut down the central nervous system as to whatever degree you can. For instance, you can sever the head off of something and it continues to move and move and move. We have footage of, of our alligator a, an hour after death doing right. a v- very f- radical full genital display that just yeah. shocked us. Yeah. And on the table, <laughs> even while cutting it, right. it continued to move. Right. Tenderloins coming out of the body, quivering on the table, separated from the body. Do you any, any idea like, what yeah. makes that I don't, happen? I don't know what the physiology yeah, of that is. But yeah, it is. It is. Um, it is fascinating and disturbing if you're, <laughs> if you're, uh, it is it's going and actually somewhat dangerous it felt like well it is and this is something that people um don't always realize with snakes and so a lot of people are scared of snakes and so what do they do they want to kill them and what do they how do they kill them they cut the head off well how many times have you heard the story about mm-hmm. the person getting bit by the whatever the <laughs> whatever venomous snake's right. head right because it's still moving like that and it can still you know close and envenomate right. um, after it's been severed. Do you ever have a close call with a gator in any level? Um, or seen anybody and, who has? Um, no, we're, I'm very careful mm-hmm. with, with uh, what we do. Um, that's one of the things, I mean, that, that you, if you're working with alligators, you have to respect them. You have to understand mm-hmm. what your limits are. And uh, so when we do all of our catching and things like that, we have a whole set of procedures 
to to follow to do that you don't ever bring an animal into the boat without its mouth tape tape shut for example right and you know i mean i've heard of people who have gotten bit or you know something like that and it's because they weren't taking those precautions but in general for people listening who who are not familiar with alligators at least we'll, we'll talk specifically about the american alligator um they are not as um aggressive towards people as a lot of uh, i guess m- people might assume yeah yeah so alligators aren't they're they're not man eaters mm-hmm. they're not really aggressive towards people un- t- unless there's certain situations there are some crocodilians yeah like uh, the australian um crocodile crocodile porosis saltwater crocodile and the nile crocodile that are known as man eaters Mm -hmm. and part of that is because they get bigger and part of it is their temperament so each species of crocodile crocodilian has its own temperament american alligators pretty much will mind their own business unless there's a reason for them not to one of the challenges we have in florida is that we've created all of these artificial wetlands or or modified natural wetlands and put houses next to them yeah and so everybody wants to be hanging out on the shoreline. Well, right. where do where did alligators historically look for food? In the shallow water areas along yeah. the shoreline. And if you're walking your dog along the shoreline, <laughs> the alligator is going to think it's something to eat. And in fact, yeah. the allig- old alligator hunters used to use barking like a dog to attract alligators because oh, for some reason that does really attract them. Oh, no kidding. And so anybody who has a dog should not be walking right. along the water <laughs> water's edge. Um, so, yeah, so so that's one of the situations. And when people feed them, oh, then wow. then they become a problem. Yeah, I bet. Um, as that's they, the, as that, they that's lose, the people that, I mean, the people become a problem. As they um, habituate themselves to people and they yeah. get more confident to come close and all yeah. that. Yeah, and, and so if there's an area where people fish all the time right. and... And you know, everybody wants to see the alligator come close. And so what do you do? You toss your fish there. Well, the next time somebody's fishing there, they don't realize that that alligator is habituated and, and is right. looking for the fish on the line. And it Start just to it leads, to, leads to bad, bad news. Um, another ch- place where there might be an issue is with a mama alligator in a nest or the mama alligator and the babies. And she will defend them. Yeah. And so, understandably, you, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But sometimes the nests are hidden, so people don't realize, don't realize that. they're there. What would be your? Um, and I, I guess outside of just you know, as we sort of wrap it up, outside the the general policies of the agency and all that, just your personal. What would you like people to know about alligators, and what would you like them to know about this habitat? Like, what would you want people to walk away with who who maybe don't have any exposure to this place or knowledge about these species? So, so I think, um, you know, alligators are really fascinating. Mm-hmm. And I think the biggest thing is that people should, should just, you know, take a, take a pause. Don't, don't be turned off by the big, scary teeth and, and respect them for, for what they are. You know, I mean, the, the crocodilians have been around for, for millions of years uh, for a reason. And there's a lot we can learn from them in terms of, you know, how they adapt to their environment and, and things like that. Um, the key is to be smart about how you put yourself in a situation with a crocodilian mm-hmm. and <laughs> and just, you know, be aware that we've moved into their habitat. And, and so we really need to be the ones paying attention to, to how those interactions happen. Last thing I want to ask you about is earlier you were talking about the different stages of Everglades, um, I guess, habitat encroachment by people and then also restoration efforts. And it sounded like a microcosm of our relationship to ecosystems around the world in some level. Um, and we're moving into this era now where we're really realizing that we, we can't just trample it. We have to somehow integrate people, wildlife, and habitat together. Looking at the big picture and then zooming into Florida itself, do you feel optimistic or pessimistic about that future and about how people, how do you feel about the viability of people and wildlife in Florida over the next, let's say, 100 years, 500 years? Yeah, I think I think in Florida we have a pretty um, educated populace and over Florida, half of Florida is set aside in natural areas, and we have a lot oh, wow. of people that care about mm-hmm. the environment. Um, and I do think that, that over time people are beginning to understand that we need to have this relationship. You're hearing more about... Um, you know, integrating the built and the natural environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're hearing more about adaptation strategies 
that that incorporate in natural mechanisms um, and things like that. And so I, I do think there's somewhat of a recognition that that we've got to we've got to work together to mm-hmm. do this. Um, I don't know. I don't know exactly how pe- how optimistic I am <laughs> in the big picture, but yeah. but there's there's pockets there that yeah. that, that give us hope. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate talking to you. Oh, you're welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.